Today, in audiobooks for me, we are going to listen to The Sign of the Four, the second book from Arthur Conan Doyle about Sherlock Holmes. This book is divided in two videos. Part one, we hope you enjoy it. The Sign of the Four, Chapter One, The Science of Deduction. Sherlock Holmes took his bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case. With his long, white, nervous fingers, he adjusted the delicate needle and rolled back his left shirt cuff. For some little time, his eyes rested thoughtfully upon the sinewy forearm and wrist, all dotted and scarred with innumerable puncture marks. Finally, he thrust the sharp point home, pressed down the tiny piston, and sank back into the velvet-lined armchair with a long sigh of satisfaction. Three times a day for many months I had witnessed this performance, but custom had not reconciled my mind to it. On the contrary, from day to day I had become more irritable at the sight, and my conscience swelled nightly within me at the thought that I had lacked the courage to protest. Again and again I had registered a vow that I should deliver my soul upon the subject. But there was that in the cool, nonchalant air of my companion, which made him the last man with whom one would care to take anything approaching to a liberty. His great powers, his masterly manner, and the experience which I had had of his many extraordinary qualities all made me diffident and backward in crossing him. Yet upon that afternoon, whether it was the bone which I had taken with my lunch, or the additional exasperation produced by the extreme deliberation of his manner, I suddenly felt that I could hold out no longer. Which is it today? I asked. Morphine or cocaine? He raised his eyes languidly from the old black letter volume which he had opened. It is cocaine, he said, a seven per cent. Solution. Would you care to try it? No, indeed, I answered brusquely. My constitution has not got over the Afghan campaign yet. I cannot afford to throw any extra strain upon it. He smiled at my vehemence. Perhaps you are right, Watson, he said. I suppose that its influence is physically a bad one. I find it, however, so transcendently stimulating and clarifying to the mind that its secondary action is a matter of small moment. But consider, I said earnestly, count the cost. Your brain may, as you say, be roused and excited, but it is a pathological and morbid process which involves increased tissue change and may at last leave a permanent weakness. You know, too, what a black reaction comes upon you. Surely the game is hardly worth the candle. Why should you, for a mere passing pleasure, risk the loss of those great powers with which you have been endowed? Remember that I speak not only as one comrade to another, but as a medical man, to one for whose constitution he is to some extent answerable. He did not seem offended. On the contrary, he put his fingertips together and leaned his elbows on the arms of his chair, like one who has a relish for conversation. My mind, he said, rebels at stagnation. Give me problems, give me work, give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis, and I am in my own proper atmosphere. I can dispense, then, with artificial stimulants. But I abhor the dull routine of existence. I crave for mental exaltation. That is why I have chosen my own particular profession, or rather created it, for I am the only one in the world. The only unofficial detective, I said, raising my eyebrows. The only unofficial consulting detective, he answered. I am the last and highest court of appeal in detection. When Gregson or Lestrade or Athony Jones are out of their depths, which, by the way, is their normal state, the matter is laid before me. I examine the data as an expert and pronounce a specialist's opinion. I claim no credit in such cases. My name figures in no newspaper. The work itself, the pleasure of finding a field for my peculiar powers, is my highest reward. But you have yourself had some experience of my methods of work 
in the Jefferson Hope case. Yes, indeed, said I cordially. I was never so struck by anything in my life. I even embodied it in a small brochure with the somewhat fantastic title of A Study in Scarlet. He shook his head sadly. I glanced over it, said he. Honestly, I cannot congratulate you upon it. Detection is, or ought to be, an exact science, and should be treated in the same cold and unemotional manner. You have attempted to tinge it with romanticism, which produces much the same effect as if you worked a love story or an elopement into the fifth proposition of Euclid. But the romance was there, I remonstrated. I could not tamper with the facts. Some facts should be suppressed, or at least a just sense of proportion should be observed in treating them. The only point in the case which deserved mention was the curious analytical reasoning from effects to causes by which I succeeded in unravelling it. I was annoyed at this criticism of a work which had been specially designed to please him. I confess, too, that I was irritated by the egotism which seemed to demand that every line of my pamphlet should be devoted to his own special doings. More than once during the years that I had lived with him in Baker Street, I had observed that a small vanity underlay my companion's quiet and didactic manner. I made no remark, however, but sat nursing my wounded leg. I had a Gisale bullet through it some time before, and though it did not prevent me from walking, it ached wearily at every change of the weather. My practice has extended recently to the continent, said Holmes after a while, filling up his old briar-root pipe. I was consulted last week by François Le Villard, who, as you probably know, has come rather to the front lately in the French detective service. He has all the Celtic power of quick intuition, but he is deficient in the wide range of exact knowledge which is essential to the higher developments of his art. The case was concerned with a will and possessed some features of interest. I was able to refer him to two parallel cases, the one at Riga in 1857 and the other at St. Louis in 1871, which have suggested to him the true solution. Here is the letter which I had this morning acknowledging my assistance. He tossed over, as he spoke, a crumpled sheet of foreign notepaper. I glanced my eyes down it, catching a profusion of notes of admiration with stray magnifique, coup de maître, and tour de force, all testifying to the ardent admiration of the Frenchman. He speaks as a pupil to his master, said I. Oh, he rates my assistance too highly, said Sherlock Holmes lightly. He has considerable gifts himself. He possesses two out of the three qualities necessary for the ideal detective. He has the power of observation and that of deduction. He is only wanting in knowledge, and that may come in time. He is now translating my small works into French. Your works? Oh, didn't you know? he cried, laughing. Yes, I have been guilty of several monographs. They are all upon technical subjects. Here, for example, is one upon the distinction between the ashes of the various tobaccos. In it, I enumerate a hundred and forty forms of cigar, cigarette, and pipe tobacco with coloured plates illustrating the difference in the ash. It is a point which is continually turning up in criminal trials, and which is sometimes of supreme importance as a clue. If you can say definitely, for example, that some murder has been done by a man who was smoking an Indian lunka, it obviously narrows your field of search. To the trained eye, there is as much difference between the black ash of a trichinopoly and the white fluff of bird's eye as there is between a cabbage and a potato. You have an extraordinary genius for minutiae, I remarked. I appreciate their importance. Here is my monograph upon the tracing of footsteps, with some remarks upon the uses of plaster of Paris as a preserver of impresses. Here, too, is a curious little work upon the influence of a trade upon the form of the hand, with lithotypes of the hands of slaters, sailors, cork cutters, compositors, weavers, and diamond polishers. 
That is a matter of great practical interest to the scientific detective, especially in cases of unclaimed bodies or in discovering the antecedents of criminals. But I weary you with my hobby. Not at all, I answered earnestly. It is of the greatest interest to me, especially since I have had the opportunity of observing your practical application of it. But you spoke just now of observation and deduction. Surely the one to some extent implies the other. Why, hardly, he answered, leaning back luxuriously in his armchair and sending up thick blue wreaths from his pipe. For example, observation shows me that you have been to the Wigmore Street post office this morning, but deduction lets me know that when there you dispatched a telegram. Right, said I, right on both points. But I confess that I don't see how you arrived at it. It was a sudden impulse upon my part, and I have mentioned it to no one. It is simplicity itself, he remarked, chuckling at my surprise, so absurdly simple that an explanation is superfluous, and yet it may serve to define the limits of observation and of deduction. Observation tells me that you have a little reddish mould adhering to your instep. Just opposite the Wigmore Street office, they have taken up the pavement and thrown up some earth which lies in such a way that it is difficult to avoid treading in it in entering. The earth is of this peculiar reddish tint, which is found, as far as I know, nowhere else in the neighbourhood. So much is observation. The rest is deduction. How then did you deduce the telegram? Why, of course I knew that you had not written a letter, since I sat opposite to you all morning. I see also in your open desk there that you have a sheet of stamps and a thick bundle of postcards. What could you go into the post office for, then, but to send a wire? Eliminate all other factors, and the one which remains must be the truth. In this case, it certainly is so, I replied after a little thought. The thing, however, is, as you say, of the simplest. Would you think me impertinent if I were to put your theories to a more severe test? On the contrary, he answered, it would prevent me from taking a second dose of cocaine. I should be delighted to look into any problem which you might submit to me. I have heard you say that it is difficult for a man to have any object in daily use without leaving the impress of his individuality upon it in such a way that a trained observer might read it. Now, I have here a watch which has recently come into my possession. Would you have the kindness to let me have an opinion upon the character or habits of the late owner? I handed him over the watch with some slight feeling of amusement in my heart, for the test was, as I thought, an impossible one and I intended it as a lesson against the somewhat dogmatic tone which he occasionally assumed. He balanced the watch in his hand, gazed hard at the dial, opened the back, and examined the works, first with his naked eyes, and then with a powerful convex lens. I could hardly keep from smiling at his crestfallen face when he finally snapped the case to and handed it back. There are hardly any data, he remarked, the watch has been recently cleaned, which robs me of my most suggestive facts. You are right, I answered. It was cleaned before being sent to me. In my heart I accused my companion of putting forward a most lame and impotent excuse to cover his failure. What data could he expect from an uncleaned watch? Though unsatisfactory, my research has not been entirely barren, he observed, staring up at the ceiling with dreamy, lacklustre eyes. Subject to your correction, I should judge that the watch belonged to your elder brother, who inherited it from your father. That you gather, no doubt, from the H.W. upon the back? Quite so. The W. suggests your own name. The date of the watch is nearly fifty years back, and the initials are as old as the watch, so it was made for the last generation. Jewelry usually descends to the eldest son, and he is most likely to have the same name as the father. Your father has, if I remember right, been dead many years. It has therefore been in the hands of your eldest brother. Right so far, said I, 
Anything else? He was a man of untidy habits, very untidy and careless. He was left with good prospects, but he threw away his chances, lived for some time in poverty with occasional short intervals of prosperity, and finally, taking to drink, he died. That is all I can gather. I sprang from my chair and limped impatiently about the room with considerable bitterness in my heart. This is unworthy of you, Holmes, I said. I could not have believed that you would have descended to this. You have made inquiries into the history of my unhappy brother, and you now pretend to deduce this knowledge in some fanciful way. You cannot expect me to believe that you have read all this from his old watch. It is unkind, and, to speak plainly, has a touch of charlatanism in it. My dear doctor, said he kindly, pray accept my apologies. Viewing the matter as an abstract problem, I had forgotten how personal and painful a thing it might be to you. I assure you, however, that I never even knew that you had a brother until you handed me the watch. Then how in the name of all that is wonderful did you get these facts? They are absolutely correct in every particular. Ah, that is good luck. I could only say what was the balance of probability I did not at all expect to be so accurate. But it was not mere guesswork? No, no, I never guess. It is a shocking habit, destructive to the logical faculty. What seems strange to you is only so because you do not follow my train of thought or observe the small facts upon which large inferences may depend. For example, I began by stating that your brother was careless. When you observe the lower part of that watch case, you notice that it is not only dinted in two places, but it is cut and marked all over from the habit of keeping other hard objects, such as coins or keys, in the same pocket. Surely it is no great feat to assume that a man who treats a fifty-guinea watch so cavalierly must be a careless man. Neither is it a very far-fetched inference that a man who inherits one article of such value is pretty well provided for in other respects. I nodded, to show that I followed his reasoning. It is very customary for pawnbrokers in England when they take a watch to scratch the number of the ticket with a pinpoint upon the inside of the case. It is more handy than a label, as there is no risk of the number being lost or transposed. There are no less than four such numbers visible to my lens on the inside of this case. Inference, that your brother was often at low water. Secondary inference, that he had occasional bursts of prosperity, or he could not have redeemed the pledge. Finally, I ask you to look at the inner plate, which contains the keyhole. Look at the thousands of scratches all round the hole. Marks where the key has slipped. What sober man's key could have scored those grooves, but you will never see a drunkard's watch without them. He winds it at night, and he leaves these traces of his unsteady hand. Where is the mystery in all this? It is as clear as daylight, I answered. I regret the injustice which I did you. I should have had more faith in your marvellous faculty. May I ask whether you have any professional inquiry on foot at present? None? Hence the cocaine. I cannot live without brain work. What else is there to live for? Stand at the window here. Was ever such a dreary, dismal, unprofitable world? See how the yellow fog swirls down the street and drifts across the dun-coloured houses. What could be more hopelessly prosaic and material? What is the use of having powers, Doctor, when one has no field upon which to exert them? Crime is commonplace, existence is commonplace, and no qualities save those which are commonplace have any function upon earth. I had opened my mouth to reply to this tirade, when with a crisp knock our landlady entered, bearing a card upon the brass salver. A young lady for you, sir, she said, addressing my companion. Miss Mary Morstan, he read. Hm, I have no recollection of the name. Ask the young lady to step up, Mrs. Hudson. Don't go, Doctor. I should prefer that you remain. Chapter 2. The Statement of the Case Miss Morstan entered the room with a firm step and an outward composure of manner. 
She was a blonde young lady, small, dainty, well-gloved, and dressed in the most perfect taste. There was, however, a plainness and simplicity about her costume, which bore with it a suggestion of limited means. The dress was a somber greyish beige, untrimmed and unbraided, and she wore a small turban of the same dull hue, relieved only by a suspicion of white feather in the side. Her face had neither regularity of feature nor beauty of complexion, but her expression was sweet and amiable, and her large blue eyes were singularly spiritual and sympathetic. In an experience of women which extends over many nations and three separate continents, I have never looked upon a face which gave a clearer promise of a refined and sensitive nature. I could not but observe that as she took the seat which Sherlock Holmes placed for her, her lip trembled, her hand quivered, and she showed every sign of intense inward agitation. I have come to you, Mr. Holmes, she said because you once enabled my employer, Mrs. Cecil Forrester, to unravel a little domestic complication. She was much impressed by your kindness and skill. Mrs. Cecil Forrester, he repeated thoughtfully. I believe that I was of some slight service to her. The case, however, as I remember it, was a very simple one. She did not think so, but at least you cannot say the same of mine. I can hardly imagine anything more strange, more utterly inexplicable, than the situation in which I find myself. Holmes rubbed his hands, and his eyes glistened. He leaned forward in his chair with an expression of extraordinary concentration upon his clear-cut, hawk-like features. "'State your case,' said he in brisk business tones. I felt that my position was an embarrassing one. You will, I am sure, excuse me, I said, rising from my chair. To my surprise, the young lady held up her gloved hand to detain me. If your friend, she said, would be good enough to stop, he might be of inestimable service to me. I relapsed into my chair. Briefly, she continued, the facts are these. My father was an officer in an Indian regiment who sent me home when I was quite a child. My mother was dead and I had no relative in England. I was placed, however, in a comfortable boarding establishment at Edinburgh, and there I remained until I was seventeen years of age. In the year 1878 my father, who was senior captain of his regiment, obtained twelve months' leave and came home. He telegraphed to me from London that he had arrived all safe, and directed me to come down at once, giving the Langham Hotel as his address. His message, as I remember, was full of kindness and love. On reaching London, I drove to the Langham, and was informed that Captain Morstan was staying there, but that he had gone out the night before and had not yet returned. I waited all day without news of him. That night, on the advice of the manager of the hotel, I communicated with the police, and next morning we advertised in all the papers. Our inquiries led to no result and from that day to this, no word has ever been heard of my unfortunate father. He came home with his heart full of hope to find some peace, some comfort, and instead she put her hand to her throat, and a choking sob cut short the sentence. The date? asked Holmes, opening his notebook. He disappeared upon the 3rd of December, 1878, nearly ten years ago. His luggage remained at the hotel. There was nothing in it to suggest a clue, some clothes, some books, and a considerable number of curiosities from the Andaman Islands. He had been one of the officers in charge of the convict guard there. Had he any friends in town? Only one that we know of, Major Sholto of his own regiment, the 34th Bombay Infantry. The Major had retired some little time before and lived at Upper Norwood. We communicated with him, of course, but he did not even know that his brother officer was in England. A singular case, remarked Holmes. I have not yet described to you the most singular part. About six years ago, to be exact, upon the 4th of May, 1882, an advertisement appeared in the Times asking for the address of Miss Mary Morstan and stating 
that it would be to her advantage to come forward. There was no name or address appended. I had at that time just entered the family of Mrs. Cecil Forrester in the capacity of governess. By her advice, I published my address in the advertisement column. The same day there arrived through the post a small cardboard box addressed to me, which I found to contain a very large and lustrous pearl. No word of writing was enclosed. Since then, every year upon the same date, there has always appeared a similar box, containing a similar pearl, without any clue as to the sender. They have been pronounced by an expert to be of a rare variety and of considerable value. You can see for yourselves that they are very handsome. She opened a flat box as she spoke and showed me six of the finest pearls that I had ever seen. Your statement is most interesting, said Sherlock Holmes. Has anything else occurred to you? Yes, and no later than today. That is why I have come to you. This morning I received this letter, which you will perhaps read for yourself. Thank you, said Holmes. The envelope too, please. Postmark, London, SW date, July 7th. Hmm. Man's thumb mark on corner. Probably postman. Best quality paper. Envelopes at sixpence a packet. Particular man in his stationery. No address. Be at the third pillar from the left outside the Lyceum Theatre tonight at seven o'clock. If you are distrustful, bring two friends. You are a wronged woman and shall have justice. Do not bring police. If you do, all will be in vain. Your unknown friend. Well, really, this is a very pretty little mystery. What do you intend to do, Miss Morstan? That is exactly what I want to ask you. Then we shall most certainly go. You and I and... Yes, why, Dr. Watson is the very man. Your correspondent says two friends. He and I have worked together before. But would he come? she asked with something appealing in her voice and expression. "'I should be proud and happy,' said I fervently, "'if I can be of any service.' "'You are both very kind,' she answered. "'I have led a retired life, and have no friends whom I could appeal to. "'If I am here at six it will do, I suppose.' "'You must not be later,' said Holmes. "'There is one other point, however. "'Is this handwriting the same as that?' upon the pearl box addresses? I have them here, she answered, producing half a dozen pieces of paper. You are certainly a model client. You have the correct intuition. Let us see now. He spread out the papers upon the table and gave little darting glances from one to the other. They are disguised hands except the letter, he said presently, but there can be no question as to the authorship. See how the irrepressible Greek E will break out, and see the twirl of the final S. They are undoubtedly by the same person. I shouldn't like to suggest false hopes, Miss Morstan, but is there any resemblance between this hand and that of your father? Nothing could be more unlike. I expected to hear you say so. We shall look out for you, then, at six. Pray allow me to keep the papers. I may look into the matter before, then. It is only half-past three. Au revoir, then. Au revoir, said our visitor, and with a bright, kindly glance from one to the other of us, she replaced her pearl box in her bosom and hurried away. Standing at the window, I watched her walking briskly down the street, until the grey turban and white feather were but a speck in the sombre crowd. What a very attractive woman, I exclaimed, turning to my companion. He had lit his pipe again and was leaning back with drooping eyelids. Is she? he said, languidly. I did not observe. You really are an automaton, a calculating machine, I cried. There is something positively inhuman in you at times. He smiled gently. It is of the first importance, he said, not to allow your judgment to be biased by personal qualities. A client is to me a mere unit a factor in a problem. The emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear reasoning. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money, and the most repellent man of my acquaintance 
is a philanthropist who has spent nearly a quarter of a million upon the London poor. In this case, however, I never make exceptions. An exception disproves the rule. Have you ever had occasion to study character in handwriting? What do you make of this fellow's scribble? It is legible and regular, I answered, a man of business habits and some force of character. Holmes shook his head. Look at his long letters, he said. They hardly rise above the common herd. That D might be an A and that L an E. Men of character always differentiate their long letters, however illegibly they may write. There is vacillation in his K's and self-esteem in his capitals. I am going out now. I have some few references to make. Let me recommend this book, one of the most remarkable ever penned. It is Winwood Reed's Martyrdom of Man. I shall be back in an hour. I sat in the window with the volume in my hand, but my thoughts were far from the daring speculations of the writer. My mind ran upon our late visitor, her smiles, the deep rich tones of her voice, the strange mystery which overhung her life. If she were seventeen at the time of her father's disappearance, she must be seven and twenty now, a sweet age when youth has lost its self-consciousness and become a little sobered by experience. So I sat and mused until such dangerous thoughts came into my head that I hurried away to my desk and plunged furiously into the latest treatise upon pathology. What was I, an army surgeon with a weak leg and a weaker banking account, that I should dare to think of such things? She was a unit, a factor, nothing more. If my future were black, it was better surely to face it like a man than to attempt to brighten it by mere will-o'-the-wisps of the imagination. Chapter 3 in quest of a solution. It was half past five before Holmes returned. He was bright, eager, and in excellent spirits, a mood which, in his case, alternated with fits of the blackest depression. There is no great mystery in this matter, he said, taking the cup of tea which I had poured out for him. The facts appear to admit of only one explanation. What, you have solved it already? Well, that would be too much to say. I have discovered a suggestive fact, that is all. It is, however, very suggestive. The details are still to be added. I have just found, on consulting the back files of the Times, that Major Sholto of Upper Norwood, late of the 34th Bombay Infantry, died upon the 28th of April, 1882. I may be very obtuse, Holmes, but I fail to see what this suggests. No, you surprise me. Look at it in this way, then. Captain Morstan disappears. The only person in London whom he could have visited is Major Sholto. Major Sholto denies having heard that he was in London. Four years later, Sholto dies. Within a week of his death, Captain Morstan's daughter receives a valuable present, which is repeated from year to year, and now culminates in a letter which describes her as a wronged woman. What wrong can it refer to except this deprivation of her father? And why should the presence begin immediately after Sholto's death unless it is that Sholto's heir knows something of the mystery and desires to make compensation? Have you any alternative theory which will meet the facts? But what a strange compensation! And how strangely made! Why, too, should he write a letter now rather than six years ago? Again, the letter speaks of giving her justice. What justice can she have? It is too much to suppose that her father is still alive. There is no other injustice in her case that you know of. There are difficulties. There are certainly difficulties, said Sherlock Holmes pensively, but our expedition of tonight will solve them all. Ah, here is a four-wheeler, and Miss Morstan is inside. Are you all ready? Then we had better go down for it is a little past the hour. I picked up my hat and my heaviest stick, but I observed that Holmes took his revolver from his drawer and slipped it into his pocket. It was clear that he thought that our night's work might be a serious one. Miss Morstan was muffled in a dark cloak, and her sensitive face was composed, but pale. 
she must have been more than woman if she did not feel some uneasiness at the strange enterprise upon which we were embarking, yet her self-control was perfect. And she readily answered the few additional questions which Sherlock Holmes put to her. Major Sholto was a very particular friend of Papa's, she said. His letters were full of allusions to the Major. He and Papa were in command of the troops at the Andaman Islands, so they were thrown a great deal together. By the way, a curious paper was found in Papa's desk which no one could understand. I don't suppose that it is of the slightest importance, but I thought you might care to see it, so I brought it with me. It is here. Holmes unfolded the paper carefully and smoothed it out upon his knee. He then very methodically examined it all over with his double lens. It is paper of native Indian manufacture, he remarked. It has at some time been pinned to a board. The diagram upon it appears to be a plan of part of a large building with numerous halls, corridors, and passages. At one point is a small cross done in red ink, and above it is 3.37 from left, in faded pencil writing. In the left-hand corner is a curious hieroglyphic like four crosses in a line with their arms touching. Beside it is written in very rough and coarse characters, the sign of the four, Jonathan Small, Mahomet Singh, Abdullah Khan, Dost Akbar. No, I confess that I do not see how this bears upon the matter, yet it is evidently a document of importance. It has been kept carefully in a pocketbook, for the one side is as clean as the other. It was in his pocketbook that we found it. Preserve it carefully, then, Miss Morstan, for it may prove to be of use to us. I begin to suspect that this matter may turn out to be much deeper and more subtle than I at first supposed. I must reconsider my ideas. He leaned back in the cab, and I could see by his drawn brow and his vacant eye that he was thinking intently. Miss Morstan and I chatted in an undertone about our present expedition and its possible outcome, but our companion maintained his impenetrable reserve until the end of our journey. It was a September evening, and not yet seven o'clock, but the day had been a dreary one, and a dense, drizzly fog lay low upon the great city. Mud-coloured clouds drooped sadly over the muddy streets. Down the strand, the lamps were but misty splotches of diffused light, which threw a feeble circular glimmer upon the slimy pavement. The yellow glare from the shop windows streamed out into the steamy, vaporous air and threw a murky, shifting radiance across the crowded thoroughfare. There was, to my mind, something eerie and ghost-like in the endless procession of faces which flitted across these narrow bars of light, sad faces, and glad, haggard, and merry. Like all humankind, they flitted from the gloom into the light, and so back into the gloom once more. I am not subject to impressions, but the dull, heavy evening, with the strange business upon which we were engaged, combined to make me nervous and depressed. I could see from Miss Morstan's manner that she was suffering from the same feeling. Holmes alone could rise superior to petty influences. He held his open notebook upon his knee, and from time to time he jotted down figures and memoranda in the light of his pocket lantern. At the Lyceum Theatre, the crowds were already thick at the side entrances. In front, a continuous stream of hansoms and four-wheelers were rattling up, discharging their cargoes of shirt-fronted men and beshawled, bediamonded women. We had hardly reached the third pillar, which was our rendezvous, before a small, dark, brisk man in the dress of a coachman accosted us. "'Are you the parties who come with Miss Morstan?' he asked. "'I am Miss Morstan, and these two gentlemen are my friends,' said she. He bent a pair of wonderfully penetrating and questioning eyes upon us. "'You will excuse me, miss?' he said with a certain dogged manner, but I was to ask you to give me your word that neither of your companions is a police officer. I give you my word on that, she answered. He gave a shrill whistle on which a street Arab led across a four-wheeler and opened the door. 
The man who had addressed us mounted to the box while we took our places inside. We had hardly done so before the driver whipped up his horse, and we plunged away at a furious pace through the foggy streets. The situation was a curious one. We were driving to an unknown place on an unknown errand, yet our invitation was either a complete hoax, which was an inconceivable hypothesis, or else we had good reason to think that important issues might hang upon our journey. Miss Morstan's demeanour was as resolute and collected as ever. I endeavoured to cheer and amuse her by reminiscences of my adventures in Afghanistan. But, to tell the truth, I was myself so excited at our situation and so curious as to our destination that my stories were slightly involved. To this day she declares that I told her one moving anecdote as to how a musket looked into my tent at the dead of night, and how I fired a double-barreled tiger cub at it. At first I had some idea as to the direction in which we were driving, but soon, what with our pace, the fog, and my own limited knowledge of London, I lost my bearings and knew nothing, save that we seemed to be going a very long way. Sherlock Holmes was never at fault, however, and he muttered the names as the cab rattled through squares and in and out, by tortuous by-streets. Rochester Row, said he, now Vincent Square. Now we come out on the Vauxhall Bridge Road. We are making for the Surrey side, apparently. Yes, I thought so. Now we are on the bridge. You can catch glimpses of the river. We did indeed get a fleeting view of a stretch of the Thames, with the lamps shining upon the broad, silent water. But our cab dashed on, and was soon involved in a labyrinth of streets upon the other side. Wordsworth Road, said my companion, Priory Road, Lark Hall Lane, Stockwell Place, Robert Street, Cold Harbour Lane. Our quest does not appear to take us to very fashionable regions. We had indeed reached a questionable and forbidding neighbourhood. Long lines of dull brick houses were only relieved by the coarse glare and tawdry brilliancy of public houses at the corner. Then came rows of two-storied villas, each with a fronting of miniature garden, and then again interminable lines of new staring brick buildings, the monster tentacles which the giant city was throwing out into the country. At last the cab drew up at the third house in a new terrace. None of the other houses were inhabited, and that at which we stopped was as dark as its neighbours, save for a single glimmer in the kitchen window. On our knocking, however, the door was instantly thrown open by a Hindu servant clad in a yellow turban, white, loose-fitting clothes, and a yellow sash. There was something strangely incongruous in this oriental figure framed in the commonplace doorway of a third-rate suburban dwelling house. "'The sahib awaits you,' said he, and even as he spoke there came a high piping voice from some inner room. "'Show them in to me, Kitmutgar!' it cried. "'Show them straight in to me!' Chapter 4 The Story of the Bald-Headed Man We followed the Indian down a sordid and common passage, ill-lit and worse furnished, until he came to a door upon the right, which he threw open. A blaze of yellow light streamed out upon us, and in the centre of the glare there stood a small man with a very high head, a bristle of red hair all round the fringe of it, and a bald, shining scalp which shot out from among it like a mountain peak from fir trees. He writhed his hands together as he stood, and his features were in a perpetual jerk, now smiling, now scowling, but never for an instant in repose. Nature had given him a pendulous lip and a too visible line of yellow and irregular teeth, which he strove feebly to conceal by constantly passing his hand over the lower part of his face. In spite of his obtrusive baldness, he gave the impression of youth. In point of fact, he had just turned his thirtieth year. "'Your servant, Miss Morstan,' he kept repeating in a thin, high voice. "'Your servant, gentlemen,' Pray step into my little sanctum. A small place, miss, but furnished to my own liking. An oasis of art in the howling desert of South London. We were all astonished by the appearance of the apartment 
into which he invited us. In that sorry house, it looked as out of place as a diamond of the first water in a setting of brass. The richest and glossiest of curtains and tapestries draped the walls, looped back here and there to expose some richly mounted painting or oriental vase. The carpet was of amber and black, so soft and so thick that the foot sank pleasantly into it, as into a bed of moss. Two great tiger skins thrown athwart it increased the suggestion of eastern luxury, as did a huge hooker which stood upon a mat in the corner. A lamp in the fashion of a silver dove was hung from an almost invisible golden wire in the centre of the room. As it burned, it filled the air with a subtle and aromatic odour. "'Mr. Thaddeus Sholto,' said the little man, still jerking and smiling, "'that is my name. You are Miss Morstan, of course. And these gentlemen—' "'This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and this is Dr. Watson.' "'A doctor, eh?' cried he, much excited. Have you your stethoscope? Might I ask you, would you have the kindness? I have grave doubts as to my mitral valve, if you would be so very good. The aortic I may rely upon, but I should value your opinion upon the mitral. I listened to his heart as requested, but was unable to find anything amiss, save indeed that he was in an ecstasy of fear, for he shivered from head to foot. It appears to be normal, I said. You have no cause for uneasiness. You will excuse my anxiety, Miss Morstan, he remarked airily. I am a great sufferer, and I have long had suspicions as to that valve. I am delighted to hear that they are unwarranted. Had your father, Miss Morstan, refrained from throwing a strain upon his heart, he might have been alive now. I could have struck the man across the face. So hot was I at this callous and off-hand reference to so delicate a matter. Miss Morstan sat down, and her face grew white to the lips. I knew in my heart that he was dead, said she. I can give you every information, said he, and what is more, I can do you justice, and I will too whatever Brother Bartholomew may say. I am so glad to have your friends here, not only as an escort to you, but also as witnesses to what I am about to do and say. The three of us can show a bold front to Brother Bartholomew, but let us have no outsiders, no police or officials. We can settle everything satisfactorily among ourselves without any interference. Nothing would annoy Brother Bartholomew more than any publicity. He sat down upon a low settee and blinked at us inquiringly with his weak, watery blue eyes. "'For my part,' said Holmes, "'whatever you may choose to say will go no further.' I nodded to show my agreement. "'That is well, that is well,' said he. "'May I offer you a glass of Chianti, Miss Morstan, or of Tokay? I keep no other wines. Shall I open a flask? No?' Well, then, I trust that you have no objection to tobacco smoke, to the mild balsamic odour of the eastern tobacco. I am a little nervous, and I find my hooker an invaluable sedative. He applied a taper to the great bowl, and the smoke bubbled merrily through the rose water. We sat all three in a semicircle, with our heads advanced and our chins upon our hands, while the strange, jerky little fellow, with his high, shining head, puffed uneasily in the centre. Nin "'When I first determined to make this communication to you,' said he, "'I might have given you my address, but I feared that you might disregard my request and bring unpleasant people with you. I took the liberty, therefore, of making an appointment in such a way that my man Williams might be able to see you first. I have complete confidence in his discretion, and he had orders, if he were dissatisfied, to proceed no further in the matter. You will excuse these precautions, but I am a man of somewhat retiring, and I might even say refined, tastes, and there is nothing more unesthetic than a policeman. I have a natural shrinking from all forms of rough materialism. I seldom come in contact with the rough crowd. I live, as you see, with some little atmosphere of elegance around me, I may call myself a patron of the arts. It is my weakness. The landscape 
is a genuine Corot, and though a connoisseur might perhaps throw a doubt upon that Salvator Rosa, there cannot be the least question about the Bougereau. I am partial to the modern French school. You will excuse me, Mr. Sholto, said Miss Morstan, but I am here at your request to learn something which you desire to tell me. It is very late, and I should desire the interview to be as short as possible. At the best, it must take some time, he answered, for we shall certainly have to go to Norwood and see Brother Bartholomew. We shall all go and try if we can get the better of Brother Bartholomew. He is very angry with me for taking the course which has seemed right to me. I had quite high words with him last night. You cannot imagine what a terrible fellow he is when he is angry. If we had to go to Norwood, it would perhaps be as well to start at once, I ventured to remark. He laughed until his ears were quite red. That would hardly do, he cried. I don't know what he would say if I brought you in that sudden way. No, I must prepare you by showing you how we all stand to each other. In the first place, I must tell you that there are several points in the story of which I am myself ignorant. I can only lay the facts before you, as far as I know them myself. My father was, as you may have guessed, Major John Sholto, once of the Indian Army. He retired some eleven years ago and came to live at Pondicherry Lodge in Upper Norwood. He had prospered in India and brought back with him a considerable sum of money, a large collection of valuable curiosities and a staff of native servants. With these advantages he bought himself a house and lived in great luxury. My twin brother, Bartholomew, and I were the only children. I very well remember the sensation which was caused by the disappearance of Captain Morstan. We read the details in the papers, and knowing that he had been a friend of our father's, we discussed the case freely in his presence. He used to join in our speculations as to what could have happened. Never for an instant did we suspect that he had the whole secret hidden in his own breast that of all men he alone knew the fate of Arthur Morstan. We did know, however, that some mystery, some positive danger, overhung our father. He was very fearful of going out alone, and he always employed two prize-fighters to act as porters at Pondicherry Lodge. Williams, who drove you tonight, was one of them. He was once lightweight champion of England. Our father would never tell us what it was he feared, but he had a most marked aversion to men with wooden legs. On one occasion, he actually fired his revolver at a wooden-legged man, who proved to be a harmless tradesman canvassing for orders. We had to pay a large sum to hush the matter up. My brother and I used to think this a mere whim of my father's, but events have since led us to change our opinion. Early in 1882, my father received a letter from India, which was a great shock to him. He nearly fainted at the breakfast table when he opened it, and from that day he sickened to his death. What was in the letter we could never discover, but I could see as he held it that it was short and written in a scrawling hand. He had suffered for years from an enlarged spleen, but he now became rapidly worse, and towards the end of April we were informed that he was beyond all hope and that he wished to make a last communication to us. When we entered his room he was propped up with pillows and breathing heavily. He besought us to lock the door and to come upon either side of the bed. Then, grasping our hands, he made a remarkable statement to us in a voice which was broken as much by emotion as by pain. I shall try and give it to you in his own very words. I have only one thing, he said, which weighs upon my mind at this supreme moment. It is my treatment of poor Morstan's orphan. The cursed greed which has been my besetting sin through life has withheld from her the treasure, half at least of which should have been hers. And yet I have made no use of it myself. So blind and foolish a thing is avarice. The mere feeling of possession has been so dear to me that I could not bear to share it with another. See that chaplet dipped with pearls beside the quinine bottle. 
Even that I could not bear to part with, although I had got it out with the design of sending it to her. You, my sons, will give her a fair share of the Agra treasure, but send her nothing, not even the chaplet, until I am gone. After all, men have been as bad as this and have recovered. I will tell you how Morstan died, he continued. He had suffered for years from a weak heart, but he concealed it from everyone. I alone knew it. When in India he and I, through a remarkable chain of circumstances, came into possession of a considerable treasure. I brought it over to England, and on the night of Morstan's arrival he came straight over here to claim his share. He walked over from the station and was admitted by my faithful old Lal Chodar, who is now dead. Morstan and I had a difference of opinion as to the division of the treasure, and we came to heated words. Morstan had sprung out of his chair in a paroxysm of anger. When he suddenly pressed his hand to his side, his face turned a dusky hue, and he fell backwards, cutting his head against the corner of the treasure chest. When I stooped over him, I found, to my horror, that he was dead. For a long time I sat half distracted, wondering what I should do. My first impulse was, of course, to call for assistance, but I could not but recognize that there was every chance that I would be accused of his murder. His death at the moment of a quarrel, and the gash in his head, would be black against me. Again, an official inquiry could not be made without bringing out some facts about the treasure, which I was particularly anxious to keep secret. He had told me that no soul upon earth knew where he had gone. There seemed to be no necessity why any soul ever should know. I was still pondering over the matter when, looking up, I saw my servant, Lal Chowdar, in the doorway. He stole in and bolted the door behind him. Do not fear, Sahib, he said. No one need know that you have killed him. Let us hide him away, and who is the wiser? I did not kill him, said I. Lal Chodar shook his head and smiled. I heard it all, Sahib, said he. I heard you quarrel, and I heard the blow. But my lips are sealed. All are asleep in the house. Let us put him away together. That was enough to decide me. If my own servant could not believe my innocence, how could I hope to make it good before twelve foolish tradesmen in a jury box? Lal Chowder and I disposed of the body that night, and within a few days the London papers were full of the mysterious disappearance of Captain Morstan. You will see from what I say that I can hardly be blamed in the matter. My fault lies in the fact that we concealed not only the body, but also the treasure, and that I have clung to Morstan's share as well as to my own. I wish you, therefore, to make restitution. Put your ears down to my mouth. The treasure is hidden in... At this instant, a horrible change came over his expression. His eyes stared wildly, his jaw dropped, and he yelled in a voice which I can never forget, Keep him out! For Christ's sake, keep him out! We both stared round at the window behind us, upon which his gaze was fixed. A face was looking in at us, out of the darkness. We could see the whitening of the nose where it was pressed against the glass. It was a bearded, hairy face with wild, cruel eyes and an expression of concentrated malevolence. My brother and I rushed towards the window, but the man was gone. When we returned to my father, his head had dropped and his pulse had ceased to beat. We searched the garden that night, but found no sign of the intruder, save that just under the window a single footmark was visible in the flower bed. But for that one trace, we might have thought that our imaginations had conjured up that wild, fierce face. We soon, however, had another and a more striking proof that there were secret agencies at work all round us. The window of my father's room was found open in the morning, his cupboards and boxes had been rifled, and upon his chest was fixed a torn piece of paper, with the words, the sign of the fours, scrawled across it. What the phrase meant, or who our secret visitor may have been, we never knew. As far as we can judge, 
None of my father's property had been actually stolen, though everything had been turned out. My brother and I naturally associated this peculiar incident with the fear which haunted my father during his life, but it is still a complete mystery to us. The little man stopped to relight his hooker and puffed thoughtfully for a few moments. We had all sat absorbed, listening to his extraordinary narrative. At the short account of her father's death, Miss Morstan had turned deadly white, and for a moment I feared that she was about to faint. She rallied, however, on drinking a glass of water, which I quietly poured out for her from a Venetian carafe upon the side table. Sherlock Holmes leaned back in his chair with an abstracted expression and the lids drawn low over his glittering eyes. As I glanced at him, I could not but think how on that very day he had complained bitterly of the commonplaceness of life. Here at least was a problem which would tax his sagacity to the utmost. Mr. Thaddeus Sholto looked from one to the other of us with an obvious pride at the effect which his story had produced, and then continued between the puffs of his overgrown pipe. "'My brother and I,' said he, "'were, as you may imagine, much excited as to the treasure which my father had spoken of. For weeks and for months we dug and delved in every part of the garden without discovering its whereabouts.' It was maddening to think that the hiding place was on his very lips at the moment that he died. We could judge the splendour of the missing riches by the chaplet which he had taken out. Over this chaplet, my brother Bartholomew and I had some little discussion. The pearls were evidently of great value, and he was averse to part with them, for between friends, my brother was himself a little inclined to my father's fault. He thought, too, that if we parted with the chaplet, it might give rise to gossip and finally bring us into trouble. It was all that I could do to persuade him to let me find out Miss Morstan's address and send her a detached pearl at fixed intervals, so that at least she might never feel destitute. It was a kindly thought, said our companion earnestly. It was extremely good of you. The little man waved his hand deprecatingly. We were your trustees, he said. That was the view which I took of it, though Brother Bartholomew could not altogether see it in that light. We had plenty of money ourselves. I desired no more. Besides, it would have been such bad taste to have treated a young lady in so scurvy a fashion. Le mauvais goût men au crime The French have a very neat way of putting these things. Our difference of opinion on this subject went so far that I thought it best to set up rooms for myself, so I left Pondicherry Lodge, taking the old Kitmutka and Williams with me. Yesterday, however, I learn that an event of extreme importance has occurred. The treasure has been discovered. I instantly communicated with Miss Morstan, and it only remains for us to drive out to Norwood and demand our share. I explained my views last night to Brother Bartholomew, so we shall be expected if not welcome, visitors. Mr. Thaddeus Sholto ceased and sat twitching on his luxurious settee. We all remained silent, with our thoughts upon the new development which the mysterious business had taken. Holmes was the first to spring to his feet. You have done well, sir, from first to last, said he. It is possible that we may be able to make you some small return by throwing some light upon that which is still dark to you. But as Miss Morstan remarked just now, it is late, and we had best put the matter through without delay. Our new acquaintance very deliberately coiled up the tube of his hooker and produced from behind a curtain a very long, befrogged top coat with astrakhan collar and cuffs. This he buttoned tightly up, in spite of the extreme closeness of the night, and finished his attire by putting on a rabbit-skin cap with hanging lappets which covered the ears, so that no part of him was visible save his mobile and peaky face. "'My health is somewhat fragile,' he remarked, as he led the way down the passage. I am compelled to be a valetudinarian. Our cab was awaiting us outside, 
and our program was evidently prearranged, for the driver started off at once at a rapid pace. Thaddeus Sholto talked incessantly in a voice which rose high above the rattle of the wheels. Bartholomew is a clever fellow, said he. How do you think he found out where the treasure was? He had come to the conclusion that it was somewhere indoors, so he worked out all the cubic space of the house and made measurements everywhere so that not one inch should be unaccounted for. Among other things, he found that the height of the building was seventy-four feet, but on adding together the heights of all the separate rooms and making every allowance for the space between, which he ascertained by borings, he could not bring the total to more than seventy feet. There were four feet unaccounted for. These could only be at the top of the building. He knocked a hole, therefore, in the lath and plaster ceiling of the highest room, and there, sure enough, he came upon another little garret above it, which had been sealed up and was known to no one. In the centre stood the treasure chest, resting upon two rafters. He lowered it through the hole, and there it lies. He computes the value of the jewels at not less than half a million sterling. At the mention of this gigantic sum, we all stared at one another open-eyed. Miss Morstan, could we secure her rights, would change from a needy governess to the richest heiress in England. Surely it was the place of a loyal friend to rejoice at such news, yet I am ashamed to say that selfishness took me by the soul and that my heart turned as heavy as lead within me. I stammered out some few halting words of congratulation and then sat downcast with my head drooped, deaf to the babble of our new acquaintance. He was clearly a confirmed hypochondriac, and I was dreamily conscious that he was pouring forth interminable trains of symptoms and imploring information as to the composition and action of innumerable quack nostrums, some of which he bore about in a leather case in his pocket. I trust that he may not remember any of the answers which I gave him that night. Holmes declares that he overheard me caution him against the great danger of taking more than two drops of castor oil while I recommended strychnine in large doses as a sedative. However that may be, I was certainly relieved when our cab pulled up with a jerk and the coachman sprang down to open the door. This, Miss Morstan, is Pondicherry Lodge, said Mr. Thaddeus Sholto as he handed her out. Chapter 5 The Tragedy of Pondicherry Lodge. It was nearly eleven o'clock when we reached this final stage of our night's adventures. We had left the damp fog of the great city behind us, and the night was fairly fine. A warm wind blew from the westward, and heavy clouds moved slowly across the sky, with half a moon peeping occasionally through the rifts. It was clear enough to see for some distance, but Thaddeus Sholto took down one of the side lamps from the carriage to give us a better light upon our way. Pondicherry Lodge stood in its own grounds and was girt round with a very high stone wall topped with broken glass. A single narrow iron-clamped door formed the only means of entrance. On this our guide knocked with a peculiar postman-like rat-tat. "'Who is there?' cried a gruff voice from within. "'It is I, McMurdo. You surely know my knock by this time. There was a grumbling sound, and a clanking and jarring of keys. The door swung heavily back, and a short, deep-chested man stood in the opening, with the yellow light of the lantern shining upon his protruded face and twinkling distrustful eyes. That you, Mr. Thaddeus? But who are the others? I had no orders about them from the master. No, McMurdo, you surprise me. I told my brother last night that I should bring some friends. He ain't been out of his room today, Mr. Thaddeus, and I have no orders. You know very well that I must stick to regulations. I can let you in, but your friends must just stop where they are. This was an unexpected obstacle. Thaddeus Sholto looked about him in a perplexed and helpless manner. This is too bad of you, McMurdo, he said. If I guarantee them, that is enough for you. There is the young lady, too. 
She cannot wait on the public road at this hour. Very sorry, Mr. Thaddeus, said the porter, inexorably. Folk may be friends of yours, and yet no friends of the master's. He pays me well to do my duty, and my duty I'll do. I don't know none of your friends. Oh, yes, you do, McMurdo, cried Sherlock Holmes genially. I don't think you can have forgotten me. Don't you remember the amateur who fought three rounds with you at Allison's rooms on the night of your benefit four years back? Not Mr. Sherlock Holmes, roared the prize fighter. God's truth, how could I have mistook you? If instead of standing there so quiet, you had just stepped up and given me that cross hit of yours under the jaw, I'd have known you without a question. Ah, you're one that has wasted your gifts you have. You might have aimed high, if you had joined the fancy. You see, Watson, if all else fails me, I have still one of the scientific professions open to me, said Holmes, laughing. Our friend won't keep us out in the cold now, I am sure. In you come, sir, in you come, you and your friends, he answered. Very sorry, Mr. Thaddeus, but orders are very strict. Had to be certain of your friends before I let them in. Inside, a gravel path wound through desolate grounds to a huge clump of a house, square and prosaic, all plunged in shadow, save where a moonbeam struck one corner and glimmered in a garret window. The vast size of the building, with its gloom and its deathly silence, struck a chill to the heart. Even Thaddeus Sholto seemed ill at ease, and the lantern quivered and rattled in his hand. I cannot understand it, he said. There must be some mistake. I distinctly told Bartholomew that we should be here, and yet there is no light in his window. I do not know what to make of it. Does he always guard the premises in this way? asked Holmes. Yes. He has followed my father's custom. He was the favorite son, you know, and I sometimes think that my father may have told him more than he ever told me. That is Bartholomew's window up there, where the moonshine strikes. It is quite bright. But there is no light from within, I think. None, said Holmes, but I see the glint of a light in that little window beside the door. Ah, that is the housekeeper's room. That is where old Mrs. Burnstone sits. She can tell us all about it. But perhaps you would not mind waiting here for a minute or two, for if we all go in together and she has no word of our coming, she may be alarmed. But hush! What is that? He held up the lantern, and his hand shook until the circles of light flickered and wavered all round us. Miss Morstan seized my wrist, and we all stood with thumping hearts, straining our ears. From the great black house there sounded through the silent night the saddest and most pitiful of sounds, the shrill, broken whimpering of a frightened woman. It is Mrs. Burnstone, said Sholto. She is the only woman in the house. Wait here. I shall be back in a moment. He hurried for the door and knocked in his peculiar way. We could see a tall old woman admit him and sway with pleasure at the very sight of him. Oh, Mr. Thaddeus, sir, I am so glad you have come. I am so glad you have come, Mr. Thaddeus, sir. We heard her reiterated rejoicings until the door was closed and her voice died away into a muffled monotone. Our guide had left us the lantern. Holmes swung it slowly round and peered keenly at the house and at the great rubbish heaps which cumbered the grounds. Miss Morstan and I stood together, and her hand was in mine. A wondrous subtle thing is love, for here were we two who had never seen each other before that day, between whom no word or even look of affection had ever passed. And yet now, in an hour of trouble, our hands instinctively sought for each other. I have marvelled at it since, but at the time it seemed the most natural thing that I should go out to her so, and, as she has often told me, there was in her also the instinct to turn to me for comfort and protection. So we stood hand in hand like two children, and there was peace in our hearts for all the dark things that surrounded us. 
What a strange place, she said, looking round, and it looks as though all the moulds in England had been let loose in it. I have seen something of the sort on the side of a hill near Ballarat, where the prospectors had been at work. And from the same cause, said Holmes, these are the traces of the treasure seekers. You must remember that they were six years looking for it. No wonder that the grounds looked like a gravel pit. At that moment, the door of the house burst open, and Thaddeus Sholto came running out, with his hands thrown forward and terror in his eyes. There is something amiss with Bartholomew, he cried. I am frightened. My nerves cannot stand it. He was indeed half blubbering with fear, and his twitching, feeble face peeping out from the great astrakhan collar had the helpless, appealing expression of a terrified child. Come into the house, said Holmes, in his crisp, firm way. Yes, do, pleaded Thaddeus Sholto. I really do not feel equal to giving directions. Now, we all followed him into the housekeeper's room, which stood upon the left-hand side of the passage. The old woman was pacing up and down with a scared look and restless picking fingers, but the sight of Miss Morstan appeared to have a soothing effect upon her. God bless your sweet, calm face, she cried with an hysterical sob. It does me good to see you. Oh, but I have been sorely tried this day. Our companion patted her thin, work-worn hand and murmured some few words of kindly womanly comfort which brought the colour back into the other's bloodless cheeks. Master has locked himself in and will not answer me, she explained. All day I have waited to hear from him, for he often likes to be alone. But an hour ago I feared that something was amiss, so I went up and peeped through the keyhole. You must go up, Mr. Thaddeus. You must go up and look for yourself. I have seen Mr. Bartholomew Sholto in joy and in sorrow for ten long years, but I never saw him with such a face on him as that. Sherlock Holmes took the lamp and led the way, for Thaddeus Sholto's teeth were chattering in his head. So shaken was he that I had to pass my hand under his arm as we went up the stairs, for his knees were trembling under him. Twice as we ascended, Holmes whipped his lens out of his pocket and carefully examined marks, which appeared to me to be mere shapeless smudges of dust upon the coconut matting which served as a stair carpet. He walked slowly from step to step, holding the lamp and shooting keen glances to right and left. Miss Morstan had remained behind with the frightened housekeeper. The third flight of stairs ended in a straight passage of some length, with a great picture in Indian tapestry upon the right of it and three doors upon the left. Holmes advanced along it in the same slow and methodical way, while we kept close at his heels, with our long black shadows streaming backwards down the corridor. The third door was that which we were seeking. Holmes knocked without receiving any answer, and then tried to turn the handle and force it open. It was locked on the inside, however, and by a broad and powerful bolt, as we could see when we set our lamp up against it. The key being turned, however, the hole was not entirely closed. Sherlock Holmes bent down to it and instantly rose again with a sharp intaking of the breath. There is something devilish in this, Watson, said he, more moved than I had ever before seen him. What do you make of it? I stooped to the hole and recoiled in horror. Moonlight was streaming into the room, and it was bright with a vague and shifty radiance. Looking straight at me, and suspended as it were in the air, for all beneath was in shadow, there hung a face, the very face of our companion Thaddeus. There was the same high, shining head, the same circular bristle of red hair, the same bloodless countenance. The features were set, however, in a horrible smile, a fixed and unnatural grin, which in that still and moonlit room was more jarring to the nerves than any scowl or contortion. So like was the face to that of our little friend that I looked round at him to make sure that he was indeed with us. Then I recalled to mind that he had mentioned to us that his brother and he were twins. 
This is terrible, I said to Holmes. What is to be done? The door must come down, he answered, and springing against it, he put all his weight upon the lock. It creaked and groaned, but did not yield. Together, we flung ourselves upon it once more, and this time it gave way with a sudden snap, and we found ourselves within Bartholomew Sholto's chamber. It appeared to have been fitted up as a chemical laboratory. A double line of glass-stoppered bottles was drawn up upon the wall opposite the door, and the table was littered over with Bunsen burners, test tubes, and retorts. In the corners stood carboys of acid in wicker baskets. One of these appeared to leak or to have been broken, for a stream of dark-coloured liquid had trickled out from it, and the air was heavy with a peculiarly pungent, tar-like odour. A set of steps stood at one side of the room, in the midst of a litter of lath and plaster, and above them there was an opening in the ceiling large enough for a man to pass through. At the foot of the steps, a long coil of rope was thrown carelessly together. By the table, in a wooden armchair, the master of the house was seated all in a heap, with his head sunk upon his left shoulder, and that ghastly, inscrutable smile upon his face. He was stiff and cold, and had clearly been dead many hours. It seemed to me that not only his features, but all his limbs were twisted and turned in the most fantastic fashion. By his hand upon the table there lay a peculiar instrument, a brown, close-grained stick with a stone head like a hammer rudely lashed on with coarse twine. Beside it was a torn sheet of notepaper with some words scrawled upon it. Holmes glanced at it and then handed it to me. You see, he said, with a significant raising of the eyebrows. In the light of the lantern I read with a thrill of horror, the sign of the four. In God's name, what does it all mean? I asked. It means murder, said he, stooping over the dead man. Ah, I expected it. Look here. He pointed to what looked like a long, dark thorn stuck in the skin just above the ear. It looks like a thorn, said I. It is a thorn. You may pick it out. But be careful, for it is poisoned. I took it up between my finger and thumb. It came away from the skin so readily that hardly any mark was left behind. One tiny speck of blood showed where the puncture had been. This is all an insoluble mystery to me, said I. It grows darker instead of clearer. On the contrary, he answered, it clears every instant. I only require a few missing links to have an entirely connected case. We had almost forgotten our companion's presence since we entered the chamber. He was still standing in the doorway the very picture of terror, wringing his hands and moaning to himself. Suddenly, however, he broke out into a sharp, querulous cry. The treasure is gone, he said. They have robbed him of the treasure. There is the hole through which we lowered it. I helped him to do it. I was the last person who saw him. I left him here last night, and I heard him lock the door as I came downstairs. What time was that? It was ten o'clock, and now he is dead, and the police will be called in, and I shall be suspected of having had a hand in it. Oh, yes, I'm sure I shall, but you don't think so, gentlemen. Surely you don't think that it was I? Is it likely that I would have brought you here if it were I? Oh, dear, oh, dear, I know that I shall go mad. He jerked his arms and stamped his feet in a kind of convulsive frenzy. You have no reason for fear, Mr. Sholto said Holmes, kindly, putting his hand upon his shoulder. Take my advice and drive down to the station to report this matter to the police. Offer to assist them in every way. We shall wait here until your return. The little man obeyed in a half-stupefied fashion, and we heard him stumbling down the stairs in the dark. Chapter 6. Sherlock Holmes Gives a Demonstration now, Watson, said Holmes, rubbing his hands, we have half an hour to ourselves. Let us make good use of it. My case is, as I have told you, almost complete. 
but we must not err on the side of overconfidence. Simple as the case seems now, there may be something deeper underlying it. Simple, I ejaculated. Surely, said he, with something of the air of a clinical professor expounding to his class. Just sit in the corner there, that your footprints may not complicate matters. Now to work. In the first place, how did these folk come, and how did they go? The door has not been opened since last night. How of the window? He carried the lamp across to it, muttering his observations aloud the while, but addressing them to himself rather than to me. Window is snibbed on the inner side. Framework is solid. No hinges at the side. Let us open it. No water pipe near. Roof quite out of reach. Yet a man has mounted by the window. It rained a little last night. Here is the print of a foot in mould upon the sill. And here is a circular muddy mark, and here again upon the floor, and here again by the table. See here, Watson. This is really a very pretty demonstration. I looked at the round, well-defined, muddy discs. This is not a footmark, said I. It is something much more valuable to us. It is the impression of a wooden stump. You see here on the sill is the boot mark, a heavy boot with the broad metal heel, and beside it is the mark of the timber toe. It is the wooden-legged man. Quite so, but there has been someone else, a very able and efficient ally. Could you scale that wall, Doctor? I looked out of the open window. The moon still shone brightly on that angle of the house. We were a good sixty feet from the ground, and, look where I would, I could see no foothold, nor as much as a crevice in the brickwork. It is absolutely impossible, I answered. Without aid it is so. But suppose you had a friend up here who lowered you this good stout rope which I see in the corner, securing one end of it to this great hook in the wall. Then I think, if you were an active man, you might swarm up, wooden leg and all. You would depart, of course, in the same fashion, and your ally would draw up the rope, untie it from the hook, shut the window, snib it on the inside, and get away in the way that he originally came. As a minor point, it may be noted, he continued, fingering the rope, that our wooden-legged friend, though a fair climber, was not a professional sailor. His hands were far from horny. My lens discloses more than one blood mark, especially towards the end of the rope, from which I gather that he slipped down with such velocity that he took the skin off his hand. This is all very well, said I, but the thing becomes more unintelligible than ever. How about this mysterious ally? How came he into the room? Yes, the ally, repeated Holmes pensively. There are features of interest about this ally. He lifts the case from the regions of the commonplace. I fancy that this ally breaks fresh ground in the annals of crime in this country, though parallel cases suggest themselves from India, and, if my memory serves me, from Senegambia. How came he then? I reiterated. The door is locked. The window is inaccessible. Was it through the chimney? The grate is much too small, he answered. I had already considered that possibility. How then? I persisted. You will not apply my precept, he said, shaking his head. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth? We know that he did not come through the door, the window, or the chimney. We also know that he could not have been concealed in the room, as there is no concealment possible. Whence, then, did he come? He came through the hole in the roof, I cried. Of course he did. He must have done so. If you will have the kindness to hold the lamp for me, we shall now extend our researches to the room above, the secret room in which the treasure was found. He mounted the steps, and seizing a rafter with either hand, he swung himself up into the garret. Then, lying on his face, he reached down for the lamp and held it while I followed him. The chamber in which we found ourselves was about ten feet one way and six the other. The floor was formed by the rafters, with thin lath and plaster between, so that in walking one had to step from beam to beam. 
The roof ran up to an apex and was evidently the inner shell of the true roof of the house. There was no furniture of any sort, and the accumulated dust of years lay thick upon the floor. "'Here you are, you see,' said Sherlock Holmes, putting his hand against the sloping wall. "'This is a trapdoor which leads out onto the roof. I can press it back, and here is the roof itself, sloping at a gentle angle. This, then, is the way by which Number One entered. Let us see if we can find any other traces of his individuality.' He held down the lamp to the floor, and as he did so, I saw for the second time that night a startled, surprised look come over his face. For myself, as I followed his gaze, my skin was cold under my clothes. The floor was covered thickly with the prints of a naked foot, clear, well-defined, perfectly formed, but scarce half the size of those of an ordinary man. Holmes. I said in a whisper, a child has done the horrid thing. He had recovered his self-possession in an instant. I was staggered for the moment, he said, but the thing is quite natural. My memory failed me, or I should have been able to foretell it. There is nothing more to be learned here. Let us go down. What is your theory, then? As to those footmarks, I asked eagerly, when we had regained the lower room once more. My dear Watson, try a little analysis yourself, said he, with a touch of impatience. You know my methods. Apply them, and it will be instructive to compare results. I cannot conceive anything which will cover the facts, I answered. It will be clear enough to you soon, he said in an offhand way. I think that there is nothing else of importance here, but I will look. He whipped out his lens and a tape measure and hurried about the room on his knees, measuring, comparing, examining, with his long, thin nose only a few inches from the planks and his beady eyes gleaming and deep-set like those of a bird. So swift, silent, and furtive were his movements like those of a trained bloodhound picking out a scent that I could not but think what a terrible criminal he would have made had he turned his energy and sagacity against the law instead of exerting them in its defence. As he hunted about, he kept muttering to himself, and finally he broke out into a loud crow of delight. "'We are certainly in luck,' said he. "'We ought to have very little trouble now. Number one has had the misfortune to tread in the creosote. You can see the outline of the edge of his small foot here, at the side of this evil-smelling mess.' The carboy has been cracked, you see, and the stuff has leaked out. What then? I asked. Why, we have got him, that's all, said he. I know a dog that would follow that scent to the world's end. If a pack can track a trailed herring across a shire, how far can a specially trained hound follow so pungent a smell as this? It sounds like a sum in the rule of three. The answer should give us the... But hello, here are the accredited representatives of the law. Heavy steps and the clamour of loud voices were audible from below, and the hall door shut with a loud crash. "'Before they come,' said Holmes, "'just put your hand here on this poor fellow's arm and here on his leg. What do you feel?' "'The muscles are as hard as a board,' I answered. "'Quite so. They are in a state of extreme contraction, far exceeding the usual rigor mortis. Coupled with this distortion of the face, this Hippocratic smile, or risus sardonicus, as the old writers called it, what conclusion would it suggest to your mind? Death from some powerful vegetable alkaloid, I answered, some strychnine like substance which would produce tetanus. That was the idea which occurred to me the instant I saw the drawn muscles of the face. On getting into the room, I at once looked for the means by which the poison had entered the system. As you saw, I discovered a thorn which had been driven or shot with no great force into the scalp. You observe that the part struck was that which would be turned towards the hole in the ceiling if the man were erect in his chair. Now examine the thorn. And then I took it up gingerly and held it in the light of the lantern. It was long, sharp, and black, with a glazed look near the point. 
as though some gummy substance had dried upon it. The blunt end had been trimmed and rounded off with a knife. Is that an English thorn? he asked. No, it certainly is not. With all these data, you should be able to draw some just inference. But here are the regulars. So the auxiliary forces may beat a retreat. As he spoke, the steps which had been coming nearer sounded loudly on the passage, and a very stout, portly man in a grey suit strode heavily into the room. He was red-faced, burly and plethoric, with a pair of very small, twinkling eyes which looked keenly out from between swollen and puffy pouches. He was closely followed by an inspector in uniform and by the still palpitating Thaddeus Sholto. Here's a business, he cried in a muffled, husky voice. Here's a pretty business, but who are all these? Why, the house seems to be as full as a rabbit warren. I think you must recollect me, Mr. Athony Jones, said Holmes quietly. Why, of course I do, he wheezed. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist. Remember you. I'll never forget how you lectured us all on causes and inferences and effects in the Bishopgate jewel case. It's true you set us on the right track, but you'll own now that it was more by good luck than good guidance. It was a piece of very simple reasoning. Oh, come now, come. Never be ashamed to own up. But what is all this? Bad business. Bad business. Stern facts here. No room for theories. How lucky that I happened to be out at Norwood over another case. I was at the station when the message arrived. What do you think the man died of? Oh, this is hardly a case for me to theorize over, said Holmes dryly. No, no. Still, we can't deny that you hit the nail on the head sometimes. Dear me. Dr. Locked, I understand. Jewels worth half a million missing. How was the window? Fastened. But there are steps on the sill. Well, well, if it was fastened, the steps could have nothing to do with the matter. That's common sense. Man might have died in a fit, but then the jewels are missing. Ha! I have a theory. These flashes come upon me at times. Just step outside, Sergeant, and you, Mr. Sholto. Your friend can remain. What do you think of this, Holmes? Sholto was, on his own confession, with his brother last night. The brother died in a fit on which Sholto walked off with the treasure. How's that? On which the dead man very considerately got up and locked the door on the inside. Hmm, there's a flaw there. Let us apply common sense to the matter. This Thaddeus Sholto was with his brother. There was a quarrel, so much we know. The brother is dead, and the jewels are gone. So much also we know. No one saw the brother from the time Thaddeus left him. His bed had not been slept in. Thaddeus is evidently in a most disturbed state of mind. His appearance is well not attractive. You see that I'm weaving my web round Thaddeus. The net begins to close upon him. You are not quite in possession of the facts yet, said Holmes. This splinter of wood, which I have every reason to believe to be poisoned, was in the man's scalp, where you still see the mark. This card, inscribed as you see it, was on the table, and beside it lay this rather curious, stone-headed instrument. How does all that fit into your theory? Confirms it in every respect, said the fat detective pompously. House is full of Indian curiosities. Thaddeus brought this up, and if this splinter be poisonous, Thaddeus may as well have made murderous use of it as any other man. The card is some hocus-pocus, a blind, as like as not. The only question is, how did he depart? Ah, of course. Here is a hole in the roof. With great activity, considering his bulk, he sprang up the steps and squeezed through into the garret, and immediately afterwards we heard his exulting voice proclaiming, that he had found the trap door. He can find something, remarked Holmes, shrugging his shoulders. He has occasional glimmerings of reason. Il n'y a pas de sauce in commode que ceux qui ont de l'esprit. You see, said Athelney Jones, reappearing down the steps again, 
Facts are better than mere theories, after all. My view of the case is confirmed. There is a trapdoor communicating with the roof, and it is partly open. It was I who opened it. Oh, indeed. You did notice it, then? He seemed a little crestfallen at the discovery. Well, whoever noticed it, it shows how our gentleman got away. Inspector. Yes, sir, from the passage. Ask Mr. Sholto to step this way. Mr. Sholto, it is my duty to inform you that anything which you may say will be used against you. I arrest you in the Queen's name as being concerned in the death of your brother. There now! Didn't I tell you? cried the poor little man, throwing out his hands and looking from one to the other of us. Don't trouble yourself about it, Mr. Sholto, said Holmes. I think that I can engage to clear you of the charge. Don't promise too much, Mr. Theorist. Don't promise too much, snapped the detective. You may find it a harder matter than you think. Not only will I clear him, Mr. Jones, but I will make you a free present of the name and description of one of the two people who were in this room last night. His name, I have every reason to believe, is Jonathan Small. He is a poorly educated man, small, active, with his right leg off, and wearing a wooden stump, which is worn away upon the inner side. His left boot has a coarse, square-toed sole with an iron band round the heel. He is a middle-aged man, much sunburned, and has been a convict. These few indications may be of some assistance to you, coupled with the fact that there is a good deal of skin missing from the palm of his hand. The other man— Ah, the other man? asked Athony Jones in a sneering voice but impressed nonetheless, as I could easily see, by the precision of the other's manner. "'Is a rather curious person,' said Sherlock Holmes, turning upon his heel. "'I hope before very long to be able to introduce you to the pair of them. A word with you, Watson.' He led me out to the head of the stair. "'This unexpected occurrence,' he said, "'has caused us rather to lose sight of the original purpose of our journey.' I have just been thinking so, I answered. It is not right that Miss Morstan should remain in this stricken house. No, you must escort her home. She lives with Mrs. Cecil Forrester in Lower Camberwell, so it is not very far. I will wait for you here if you will drive out again. Or perhaps you're too tired? By no means. I don't think I could rest until I know more of this fantastic business. I have seen something of the rough side of life, but I give you my word that this quick succession of strange surprises tonight has shaken my nerve completely. I should like, however, to see the matter through with you now that I have got so far. Your presence will be of great service to me, he answered. We shall work the case out independently and leave this fellow Jones to exult over any mare's nest which he may choose to construct. When you have dropped Miss Morstan, I wish you to go on to number three, Pinchin Lane, down near the water's edge at Lambeth. The third house on the right-hand side is a bird stuffer's. Sherman is the name. You will see a weasel holding a young rabbit in the window. Knock old Sherman up and tell him, with my compliments, that I want Toby at once. You will bring Toby back in the cab with you. A dog, I suppose. Yes, a queer mongrel with a most amazing power of scent. I would rather have Toby's help than that of the whole detective force of London. I shall bring him then, said I. It is one now. I ought to be back before three if I can get a fresh horse. And I, said Holmes, shall see what I can learn from Mrs. Burnstone and from the Indian servant, who, Mr. Thaddeus tell me, sleeps in the next garret. Then I shall study the great Jones's methods and listen to his not too delicate sarcasms. Wir sind gewohnt, dass die Menschen verhöhnen, was sie nicht verstehen. Goethe is always pithy. Chapter 7 The Episode of the Barrel The police had brought a cab with them, and in this I escorted Miss Morstan back to her home. After the angelic fashion of women, she had borne trouble with a calm face as long as there was someone weaker than herself to support, and I had found her bright and placid by the side of the frightened housekeeper. 
In the cab, however, she first turned faint and then burst into a passion of weeping. So sorely had she been tried by the adventures of the night. She has told me since that she thought me cold and distant upon that journey. She little guessed the struggle within my breast or the effort of self-restraint which held me back. My sympathies and my love went out to her, even as my hand had in the garden. I felt that years of the conventionalities of life could not teach me to know her sweet, brave nature as had this one day of strange experiences. Yet there were two thoughts which sealed the words of affection upon my lips. She was weak and helpless, shaken in mind and nerve. It was to take her at a disadvantage to obtrude love upon her at such a time. Worse still, she was rich. If Holmes's researches were successful, she would be an heiress. Was it fair? Was it honourable that a half-pay surgeon should take such advantage of an intimacy which chance had brought about? Might she not look upon me as a mere vulgar fortune-seeker? I could not bear to risk that such a thought should cross her mind. This agra-treasure intervened like an impassable barrier between us. It was nearly two o'clock when we reached Mrs. Cecil Forrester's. The servants had retired hours ago, but Mrs. Forrester had been so interested by the strange message which Miss Morstan had received that she had sat up in the hope of her return. She opened the door herself, a middle-aged, graceful woman, and it gave me joy to see how tenderly her arm stole round the other's waist, and how motherly was the voice in which she greeted her. She was clearly no mere paid dependent, but an honoured friend. I was introduced, and Mrs. Forrester earnestly begged me to step in and tell her our adventures. I explained, however, the importance of my errand, and promised faithfully to call and report any progress which we might make with the case. As we drove away, I stole a glance back, and I still seemed to see that little group on the step, the two graceful clinging figures, the half-opened door, the hall light shining through stained glass, the barometer, and the bright stair rods. It was soothing to catch, even that passing glimpse of a tranquil English home in the midst of the wild, dark business which had absorbed us. And the more I thought of what had happened, the wilder and darker it grew. I reviewed the whole extraordinary sequence of events as I rattled on through the silent, gaslit streets. There was the original problem, that at least was pretty clear now. The death of Captain Morstan, the sending of the pearls, the advertisement, the letter. We had had light upon all those events. They had only led us, however, to a deeper and far more tragic mystery. The Indian treasure, the curious plan found among Morstan's baggage, the strange scene at Major Sholto's death, the rediscovery of the treasure immediately followed by the murder of the discoverer, the very singular accompaniments to the crime, the footsteps, the remarkable weapons, the words upon the card, corresponding with those upon Captain Morstan's chart, here was indeed a labyrinth in which a man less singularly endowed than my fellow lodger might well despair of ever finding the clue. Pinchin Lane was a row of shabby two-storied brick houses in the lower quarter of Lambeth. I had to knock for some time at no other three before I could make my impression. At last, however, there was the glint of a candle behind the blind, and a face looked out at the upper window. "'Go on, you drunken vagabone!' said the face. If you kick up any more row, I'll open the kennels and let out forty-three dogs upon you. If you'll let one out? It's just what I have come for, said I. Go on, yelled the voice. So help me gracious, I have a wiper in the bag and I'll drop it on your head if you don't hook it. But I want a dog, I cried. I won't be argued with shouted Mr. Sherman. Now stand clear, for when I say three, down goes the wiper. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I began, but the words had a most magical effect, for the window instantly slammed down, and within a minute the door was unbarred and open. 
Mr. Sherman was a lanky, lean old man with stooping shoulders, a stringy neck, and blue-tinted glasses. A friend of Mr. Sherlock is always welcome, said he. Step in, sir. Keep clear of the badger, for he bites. Ah, naughty, naughty, would you take a nip at the gentleman? This to a stoat, which thrust its wicked head and red eyes between the bars of its cage. Don't mind that, sir. It's only a slow worm. It hain't got no fangs, so I gives it the run of the room, for it keeps the beetles down. You must not mind my being just a little short with you at first, for I'm guyed at by the children, and there's many a one just comes down this lane to knock me up. What was it that Mr. Sherlock Holmes wanted, sir? He wanted a dog of yours. Ah, that would be Toby. Yes, Toby was the name. Toby lives at Noba 7 on the left here. He moved slowly forward with his candle among the queer animal family which he had gathered round him. In the uncertain shadowy light I could see dimly that there were glancing, glimmering eyes peeping down at us from every cranny and corner. Even the rafters above our heads were lined by solemn fowls who lazily shifted their weight from one leg to the other as our voices disturbed their slumbers. Toby proved to be an ugly, long-haired, lop-eared creature, half spaniel and half lurcher, brown and white in colour, with a very clumsy waddling gait. It accepted, after some hesitation, a lump of sugar which the old naturalist handed to me, and having thus sealed an alliance, it followed me to the cab and made no difficulties about accompanying me. It had just struck three on the palace clock when I found myself back once more at Pondicherry Lodge. The ex-prize fighter McMurdo had, I found, been arrested as an accessory, and both he and Mr. Sholto had been marched off to the station. Two constables guarded the narrow gate, but they allowed me to pass with the dog on my mentioning the detective's name. Holmes was standing on the doorstep, with his hands in his pockets, smoking his pipe. Ah, you have him there, said he. Good dog, then. Athene Jones has gone. We have had an immense display of energy since you left. He has arrested not only friend Thaddeus, but the gatekeeper, the housekeeper, and the Indian servant. We have the place to ourselves, but for a sergeant upstairs. Leave the dog here and come up. We tied Toby to the hall table and reascended the stairs. The room was as he had left it, save that a sheet had been draped over the central figure. A weary-looking police sergeant reclined in the corner. "'Lend me your bullseye, sergeant,' said my companion. "'Now tie this bit of card round my neck so as to hang it in front of me. Thank you. Now I must kick off my boots and stockings. Just you carry them down with you, Watson. I am going to do a little climbing, and dip my handkerchief into the creosote. That will do. Now come up into the garret with me for a moment. We clambered up through the hole. Holmes turned his light once more upon the footsteps in the dust. I wish you particularly to notice these footmarks, he said. Do you observe anything noteworthy about them? They belong, I said, to a child or a small woman. Apart from their size, though, is there nothing else? They appear to be much as other footmarks. Not at all. Look here. This is the print of a right foot in the dust. Now I make one with my naked foot beside it. What is the chief difference? Your toes are all cramped together. The other print has each toe distinctly divided. Quite so. That is the point. Bear that in mind. Now would you kindly step over to that flap window and smell the edge of the woodwork? I shall stay here as I have this handkerchief in my hand. I did as he directed, and was instantly conscious of a strong, tarry smell. That is where he put his foot in getting out. If you can trace him, I should think that Toby will have no difficulty. Now run downstairs, loose the dog, and look out for Blondin. By the time that I got out into the grounds, Sherlock Holmes was on the roof, and I could see him like an enormous glowworm crawling very slowly along the ridge. I lost sight of him behind a stack of chimneys, but he presently reappeared and then vanished once more 
upon the opposite side. When I made my way round there, I found him seated at one of the corner eaves. That you, Watson? he cried. Yes. This is the place. What is that black thing down there? A water barrel. Top on it. Yes. No sign of a ladder? No. Confound the fellow. It's a most breakneck place. I ought to be able to come down where he could climb up. The water pipe feels pretty firm. Here goes, anyhow. There was a scuffling of feet, and the lantern began to come steadily down the side of the wall. Then, with a light spring, he came onto the barrel, and from there to the earth. It was easy to follow him, he said, drawing on his stockings and boots. Tiles were loosened the whole way along, and in his hurry he had dropped this. It confirms my diagnosis, as you doctors express it. The object which he held up to me was a small pocket or pouch, woven out of coloured grasses and with a few tawdry beads strung round it. In shape and size, it was not unlike a cigarette case. Inside were half a dozen spines of dark wood, sharp at one end and rounded at the other, like that which had struck Bartholomew Sholto. They are hellish things, said he. Look out that you don't prick yourself. I'm delighted to have them, for the chances are that they are all he has. There is the less fear of you or me finding one in our skin before long. I would sooner face a martini bullet myself. Are you game for a six-mile trudge, Watson? Certainly, I answered. Your leg will stand it? Oh, yes. Here you are, doggy. Good old Toby. Smell it, Toby. Smell it. He pushed the creosote handkerchief under the dog's nose, while the creature stood with its fluffy legs separated and with a most comical cock to its head like a connoisseur sniffing the bouquet of a famous vintage. Holmes then threw the handkerchief to a distance, fastened a stout cord to the mongrel's collar, and led him to the foot of the water barrel. The creature instantly broke into a succession of high, tremulous yelps, and with his nose on the ground and his tail in the air, pattered off upon the trail at a pace which strained his leash and kept us at the top of our speed. The east had been gradually whitening, and we could now see some distance in the cold grey light. The square, massive house, with its black empty windows and high, bare walls, towered up, sad and forlorn, behind us. Our course led right across the grounds, in and out among the trenches and pits with which they were scarred and intersected. The whole place, with its scattered dirt heaps and ill-grown shrubs, had a blighted, ill-omened look which harmonized with the black tragedy which hung over it. On reaching the boundary wall, Toby ran along, whining eagerly underneath its shadow, and stopped finally in a corner screened by a young beech. Where the two walls joined, several bricks had been loosened, and the crevices left were worn down and rounded upon the lower side, as though they had frequently been used as a ladder. Holmes clambered up, and taking the dog from me, he dropped it over upon the other side. There's the print of Wooden Leg's hand, he remarked, as I mounted up beside him. You see the slight smudge of blood upon the white plaster. What a lucky thing it is that we have had no very heavy rain since yesterday. The scent will lie upon the road in spite of their eight-and-twenty hours' start. I confess that I had my doubts myself when I reflected upon the great traffic which had passed along the London road in the interval. My fears were soon appeased, however. Toby never hesitated or swerved, but waddled on in his peculiar rolling fashion. Clearly the pungent smell of the creosote rose high above all other contending scents. Do not imagine, said Holmes, that I depend for my success in this case upon the mere chance of one of these fellows having put his foot in the chemical. I have knowledge now which would enable me to trace them in many different ways. This, however, is the readiest, and, since fortune has put it into our hands, I should be culpable if I neglected it. It has, however, prevented the case from becoming the pretty little intellectual problem, which it at one time promised to be, 
There might have been some credit to be gained out of it, but for this too palpable clue. There is credit and to spare, said I. I assure you, Holmes, that I marvel at the means by which you obtain your results in this case even more than I did in the Jefferson Hope murder. The thing seems to me to be deeper and more inexplicable. How, for example, could you describe with such confidence the wooden-legged man? Sure, my dear boy. It was simplicity itself. I don't wish to be theatrical. It is all patent and above board. Two officers who are in command of a convict guard learn an important secret as to buried treasure. A map is drawn for them by an Englishman named Jonathan Small. You remember that we saw the name upon the chart in Captain Morstan's possession. He had signed it in behalf of himself and his associates, the sign of the four, as he somewhat dramatically called it. Aided by this chart, the officers, or one of them, gets the treasure and brings it to England, leaving, we will suppose, some condition under which he received it unfulfilled. Now then, why did not Jonathan Small get the treasure himself? The answer is obvious. The chart is dated at a time when Morstan was brought into close association with convicts. Jonathan Small did not get the treasure because he and his associates were themselves convicts and could not get away. But that is mere speculation, said I. It is more than that. It is the only hypothesis which covers the facts. Let us see how it fits in with the sequel. Major Sholto remains at peace for some years, happy in the possession of his treasure. Then he receives a letter from India which gives him a great fright. What was that? A letter to say that the men whom he had wronged had been set free. Or had escaped. That is much more likely, for he would have known what their term of imprisonment was. It would not have been a surprise to him. What does he do then? He guards himself against a wooden-legged man. A white man, mark you, for he mistakes a white tradesman for him and actually fires a pistol at him. Now only one white man's name is on the chart. The others are Hindus or Mohammedans. There is no other white man. Therefore we may say with confidence that the wooden-legged man is identical with Jonathan Small. Does the reasoning strike you as being faulty? No, it is clear and concise. Well, now, let us put ourselves in the place of Jonathan Small. Let us look at it from his point of view. He comes to England with the double idea of regaining what he would consider to be his rights and of having his revenge upon the man who had wronged him. He found out where Sholto lived, and very possibly he established communications with someone inside the house. There is this butler, Lal Rao, whom we have not seen. Mrs. Burnstone gives him far from a good character. Small could not find out, however, where the treasure was hid, for no one ever knew, save the major and one faithful servant who had died. Suddenly Small learns that the major is on his deathbed. In a frenzy, lest the secret of the treasure die with him, he runs the gauntlet of the guards, makes his way to the dying man's window, and is only deterred from entering by the presence of his two sons. Mad with hate, however, against the dead man, he enters the room that night, searches his private papers in the hope of discovering some memorandum relating to the treasure, and finally leaves a memento of his visit in the short inscription upon the card. He had doubtless planned beforehand that should he slay the Major, he would leave some such record upon the body as a sign that it was not a common murder, but from the point of view of the four associates, something in the nature of an act of justice. Whimsical and bizarre conceits of this kind are common enough in the annals of crime and usually afford valuable indications as to the criminal. Do you follow all this? Very clearly. Now what could Jonathan Small do? He could only continue to keep a secret watch upon the efforts made to find the treasure. Possibly he leaves England and only comes back at intervals. Then comes the discovery of the garret, and he is instantly informed of it. We again trace the presence of some confederate in the household. Jonathan, with his wooden leg, 
is utterly unable to reach the lofty room of Bartholomew Sholto. He takes with him, however, a rather curious associate who gets over this difficulty but dips his naked foot into creosote, whence comes Toby and a six-mile limp for a half-pay officer with a damaged tendo Achilles. But it was the associate, and not Jonathan, who committed the crime. Quite so, and rather to Jonathan's disgust, to judge by the way he stamped about when he got into the room. He bore no grudge against Bartholomew Sholto, and would have preferred if he could have been simply bound and gagged. He did not wish to put his head in a halter. There was no help for it, however. The savage instincts of his companion had broken out, and the poison had done its work. So Jonathan Small left his record, lowered the treasure box to the ground, and followed it himself. That was the train of events as far as I can decipher them. Of course, as to his personal appearance, he must be middle-aged, and must be sunburned after serving his time in such an oven as the Andamans. His height is readily calculated from the length of his stride, and we know that he was bearded. His hairiness was the one point which impressed itself upon Thaddeus Sholto when he saw him at the window. I don't know that there is anything else. The associate? Ah, well, there is no great mystery in that. But you will know all about it soon enough. How sweet the morning air is. See how that one little cloud floats like a pink feather from some gigantic flamingo. Now the red rim of the sun pushes itself over the London cloud bank. It shines on a good many folk, but on none, I dare bet, who are on a stranger errand than you and I. How small we feel, with our petty ambitions and strivings in the presence of the great elemental forces of nature. Are you well up in your Jean-Paul? Fairly so. I worked back to him through Carlisle. That was like following the brook to the parent lake. He makes one curious but profound remark. It is that the chief proof of man's real greatness lies in his perception of his own smallness. It argues, you see, a power of comparison and of appreciation, which is in itself a proof of nobility. There is much food for thought in Richter. You have not a pistol, have you? I have my stick. It is just possible that we may need something of the sort if we get to their lair. Jonathan, I shall leave to you, but if the other turns nasty, I shall shoot him dead. He took out his revolver as he spoke, and, having loaded two of the chambers, he put it back into the right-hand pocket of his jacket. We had during this time been following the guidance of Toby down the half-rural villa-lined roads which lead to the metropolis. Now, however, we were beginning to come among continuous streets, where labourers and dockmen were already astir, and slatternly women were taking down shutters and brushing doorsteps. At the square-topped corner public houses, business was just beginning, and rough-looking men were emerging, rubbing their sleeves across their beards after their morning wet. Strange dogs sauntered up and stared wonderingly at us as we passed, but our inimitable Toby looked neither to the right nor to the left, but trotted onwards with his nose to the ground and an occasional eager whine which spoke of a hot scent. We had traversed Streatham, Brixton, Camberwell, and now found ourselves in Kennington Lane, having borne away through the side streets to the east of the Oval. The men whom we pursued seemed to have taken a curiously zigzag road with the idea probably of escaping observation. They had never kept to the main road if a parallel side street would serve their turn. At the foot of Kennington Lane, they had edged away to the left through Bond Street and Miles Street. Where the latter street turns into Knight's Place, Toby ceased to advance, but began to run backwards and forwards with one ear cocked and the other drooping, the very picture of canine indecision. Then he waddled round in circles, looking up to us from time to time, as if to ask for sympathy in his embarrassment. "'What the deuce is the matter with the dog?' growled Holmes. "'They surely would not take a cab or go off in a balloon.' "'Perhaps they stood here for some time,' I suggested. "'Ah, it's all right. He's off again,' 
said my companion in a tone of relief. He was indeed off, for after sniffing round again, he suddenly made up his mind and darted away with an energy and determination such as he had not yet shown. The scent appeared to be much hotter than before, for he had not even to put his nose on the ground, but tugged at his leash and tried to break into a run. I could see by the gleam in Holmes's eyes that he thought we were nearing the end of our journey. Our course now ran down Nine Elms until we came to Broderick and Nelson's large timber yard, just past the White Eagle Tavern. Here the dog, frantic with excitement, turned down through the side gate into the enclosure where the sawyers were already at work. On the dog, raced through sawdust and shavings, down an alley, round a passage, between two wood piles, and finally, with a triumphant yelp, sprang upon a large barrel which still stood upon the hand trolley on which it had been brought. With lolling tongue and blinking eyes, Toby stood upon the cask, looking from one to the other of us for some sign of appreciation. The staves of the barrel and the wheels of the trolley were smeared with a dark liquid, and the whole air was heavy with the smell of creosote. Sherlock Holmes and I looked blankly at each other and then burst simultaneously into an uncontrollable fit of laughter.